Yeah, so this will be recorded. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for showing up in person and for attending online if you can't, couldn't show up in person. Uh, we are welcoming back to the college and the department, uh, Dr. Runa Bakshi. And Runa is actually working in the section of environmental epidemiology and toxicology at the Louisiana Department of Health. She is an alumni of our department, graduating with a PhD from Dr. Ju Kim's lab in 2017. And she, she is gonna talk to us about her role as an environmental health scientist and project manager. Uh, she, she does statistical evaluation to assess community environmental health and hazards at the county and sub-county, you mean parish and sub-parish levels. <laughs> All right. She has been instrumental in developing and piloting what's called the BREATHE program, which is bringing respiratory health equity for asthmatics through healthier environments. And if you don't know, Louisiana is actually one of the highest states for uh, asthma uh, disparities in the country. This is designed specifically to serve low-income children with asthma and environmental concerns. So she actually has a link to our lab. Uh, in addition, with her research background in molecular biology, she has been serving as an advisor and subject matter expert to the LDH COVID-19 testing team and director of the LDH Institutional Review Board. With an interest in both basic and applied sciences, Dr. Bakshi is committed to better understanding the molecular aspects of environmental health while promoting health equity by assisting communities through strategic health interventions and policy change. And through that, uh, we have come to know Runa uh, through the Superfund Research Program, and she's actually a partner with us there. And we're hoping to bring her into the fold or back into the fold as an adjunct faculty member uh, in the Department of Biological Sciences. So this is a seminar in preparation for that. I'll then present her, her CV to you at the BMB meeting, and then we'll go from there, uh, and I'll let Runa know. But otherwise, Runa's going to tell us about some of the things she's seeing uh, in health here in Louisiana and uh, Runa, welcome. Thank you, can everybody hear me? Wonderful, thank you. So uh, the, the topic for my today is chances of birth impact your health. And uh, if you're wondering what that means, what understanding the health impacts of social and environmental vulnerability means, I you know, sort of ask you to just take a moment and let me see if I can move my slide. Um, just think, how would you answer the question if I asked you, who are you? Okay, so just take a second, think about, think about it, right? How would you answer it? So if I had to answer it, I might say, I'm Bruna, I'm 30 something, I'm female, South Asian. I might say I'm the daughter of my parents. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm alumni of LSU. I work as a scientist at LDH, live in Baton Rouge, not too far from here, really. I might say I'm a foodie, I'm an artist, I'm a gardener. You know, I, I might have a lot of descriptors for myself. And what you may not realize is all of these things have an impact on how long I live and how well I live. As it turns out, when I say I'm Runa, well, there's, there's a lot of personal factors involved there, right? So there's my genetics, my choices, what choices I make in life, what exposures I've had in my life, 30 something, it's, it's, it's a cumulative exposure over 30 years. As a female, I'm exposed to hormones that men, for example, are not. Uh, South Asian heritage, so there's uh, genetics related to ancestry, genetics related more directly from my parents. Alumni of LSU indicates that I have a certain level of education, uh, which opens up to an employment in the United States. That means I have health insurance. I have access to health care. Um, I live in Baton Rouge. And uh, Baton Rouge, as some of you may or may not know, is not quite the worst when it comes to air pollution exposure, but it isn't ex exactly the best either. Uh, not too uh, long ago, I saw a list of cities with the worst places to be if you have spring allergies and Baton Rouge made the list. Uh, yeah, let's just leave it at that. Uh, foodie, so what, what foods do I eat, right? A, a wide variety and unhealthier the better. Um, artists, I uh, used to paint with oil paints for the longest time and believe it or not, there's actually a paint name called Lead White. Uh, lead is a neurotoxin and things have moved on since then. They try not to put too much lead, but you know, it gives you an idea of exposures there. Uh, a lot of you may not know, but there's lead in Louisiana soil. So if I'm just kind of putting my hands in there, getting it dirty, I could be exposing myself to things if I'm growing the food that I eat um, in Louisiana soil, I could be exposing something to myself. 
So as it turns out, right, all of these things, everything from personal choices to my lifestyle, the communities I live in, the built environment I live in, I live in a place where I can reasonably walk. I, you know, I was, I was just telling Dr. Cormier, like, you know, everything is close to me, but everything is still 15 minutes away because I'm stuck in traffic. Um, and sometimes uh, all those parts are not equally well kept and then you have your windows down, you're exposed to stuff. Um, you know, the global ecosystem that we live in, all of this comes together to create what's called the social and environmental determinants of health. This might be your economic conditions, neighborhood you live in, the physical environment, education. And again, like I, I you know, sort of alluded to earlier, in the United States, that is very closely connected to what kind of healthcare you have access to, food, and of course, the social and community context that you live in. And all of these things can really, you know, even if you have identical twins, it can take them in very different pathways because of diff differences in these social and environmental exposures. So this was a very famous paper. My background is in epigenetics. Uh, this is looking at DNA methylation. Uh, DNA methylation is modification with a methyl group on the DNA. It can modulate gene expression. What we're looking at here is uh, identical twins at three years old. These are their chromosomes, and you see how much of it is yellow, indicating identical DNA methylation between the two twins. But by the time they're 50, they've had very different life experiences. And you see that huge parts of their chromosomes now are differentially methylated. Um, and these things have very real life consequences. Not long ago, in fact, just a couple of years ago, there was this case study that came out where one twin developed ovarian cancer and the other identical twin did not. And they were able to trace it back to DNA methylation differences at the BRCA1 site. Um, but more recently in the age of COVID, how could we not talk about it, right? Um, social determinants of health do not affect people equally. Um, you know, there are, there are people, the lives that you, that you live, lives that people are forced to live because of chances of our choices, everything, right? Uh, make a difference in the likelihood that you just develop chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, all of these things that we've been hearing time and time again, we're probably sick of hearing how all of these things can have um, effects on your COVID-19 outcomes and have a much more severe effect um, if you suffer from these conditions and get COVID-19. Um, and one of the reasons I implore you to pay attention to this is because effects from social and environmental determinants of health happen to be multi-generational. And there is a lot on this slide, but I'll walk you through it. So hopefully it wouldn't be uh, too, too much. Um, so I'll walk you through a simple example of air pollution exposure. And let's say you have a mom who's exposed to a lot of air pollution throughout her life, also while she's pregnant. So we have maternal exposure. Uh, we have uh, exposure to the fetus while it's in the uterus. Uh, that's the F1 generation. And then you also have the uh, germ cells developing in the fetus that's also exposed. Um, and this could potentially affect the F2 generation. If you think this is very far-fetched, this has actually been shown in case of maternal smoking. Uh, less strong evidence when it comes to like external uh, air pollution, ambient air pollution exposure, but not totally out of the realm of belief. Uh, but let's go back to the F1. This child is born, it grows up, and there's a lifetime, cumulative lifetime exposure um, of, you know, just all kinds of things. And in this case, we're just talking about air pollution, which then has a bearing on their disease conditions. And with ambient air pollution, it's been shown uh, very strongly that it connects um, to a lot of cardiovascular diseases and a lot of respiratory diseases and how likely you are to suffer from these things. Um, if you're wondering how, how these things are happening, um, you know, this is, this is a, a, a side of things that's still very much under active research. So, you know, there's been reports that say it's connected with oxidative stress as that goes up. One of the things that could happen is global DNA methylation goes down and then it, a lot of individual sites, it tends to go up and then you have changes in gene expressions, which then lead to changes in your likelihood of developing these conditions. So looking at all this, you're probably thinking, great, but how is this multi-generational? As it turns out that it's not just the biological things that affect this, right? All these biological factors come together with the social 
structures that makes this multi-generational open effect. If you think about it, if you're someone that's poor and is born, say, in a, what we call an environmental justice community, a community where they're more likely to be exposed to environmental factors that can have negative effects on them, their health, you're poor, that means something for what level of education you're able to get in a lot of different life factors, right? And a lot of times the cycle of poverty means that it's very hard for you to escape those conditions and it becomes very hard for you to move and, and go somewhere where it's healthier. And so then you live there, you're exposed to those things continually throughout your life. If you have children there, so on, so on. So I hope you see how the social structures perpetuate these cycles that then affect biological structures. Um, I mentioned, I sort of alluded to earlier that um, social environmental determinants of health do affect people unequally. Uh, globally, you know, you have about a 10% uh, of premature deaths uh, in, the, in North America it has been alluded to or sort of connected with air pollution exposure, but in Asia, it's, it's a lot higher. Uh, but even if you look at it within the United States, there are a lot of differences that we see, especially on the racial uh, end of things. So this is a study which looked at several different uh, measures related to physical and mental health, health behaviors, uh, birth risks. So this is looking at infant mortality, maternal mortality, a lot of different things like that. Uh, HIV AIDS uh, and prevalence of mortality due to certain conditions like cancer. And what they see is um, blacks often fare worse right on the huge number of these health measures uh, with Native Americans uh, a very close second. And these things, you know, have resulting in, you know, result in inequities in health. And this is again, going back to COVID-19. So if you're looking at uh, COVID-19 age adjusted risk of infection, hospitalization and deaths. So everything is normalized to how often white people get sick, are hospitalized or die. And if you look at the darkest blue bar here, looking at the black population, they, their risk of infection is almost the same, right? But they're two and a half times more likely to be hospitalized and about twice more likely to die. So this brings us to uh, the stuff that I work on, which is, which is very closely related. Um, these things that I've been telling you are not just in general, they very much affect our lives in Louisiana. And so I'll, I'll tell you two stories today. One is called COVID-19 and looking at it from an environmental justice lens. And the second story is the one uh, that is in collaboration with the Superfund Research Program. And it's called Where You Live May Matter to Your Heart and Lungs. Okay, so the first story is sort of in three chapters. Uh, we'll identify the problem, locate it, and then address it. And to give you a little background on, on why we got into this, uh, there was a paper in 2021 uh, that sort of identified all of Southeast Louisiana, uh, sorry, Southeast United States, Louisiana included. Um, and they were able to show how you see all these counties in dark red. They were able to show that COVID-19 incidence rate was high in a lot of areas where hazardous air pollutant respiratory risk was also high. So this is sort of those high, high counties. Um, and most of you know, there was this very famous paper out of Harvard that showed that deaths are higher if you are exposed to um, PM 2.5 pollution, deaths from COVID-19 are higher. Um, but all of these were sort of at the county level or the parish level. Um, but if you're really going to do something, I, I work with public health, um, you really need to identify those individual communities so you can go do something. Because a lot of times these things happen in very small pockets. So then when you just look at it in a wide swath of things, you're sort of just averaging everything out and don't see anything. Um, so we had two objectives here. One is to, you know, really look at this connection between air pollution, social vulnerability, and COVID at the census tract level. But we also threw in asthma. So asthma is it's a chronic condition, right? It's a chronic condition with a lot of health disparities in Louisiana, um, and it also um, is is connected quite heavily with, you know, the huge environmental component there. A lot of environmental triggers for asthma. Um, if you have moderate to severe asthma, it might increase your risk of severe disease with COVID-19. Um, but remember, in the age before vaccines, there's also uh, a possibility that COVID-19 safety measures could worsen 
your asthma um, or beat triggers in itself. So for instance, if you live in an unhealthy home and you're asked to quarantine in that home, you're being exposed to all those things for a lot longer than you would otherwise. Or if you live in an area that is very polluted um, and you spend more time socializing outside, all that time you're breathing all of these things, that's not good for you. Um, and so this is something that we wanted to investigate, look at if there's any connection um, between asthma and all of these factors. Um, and then, of course, once we, once we identify if there is a connection, we, of course, wanted to find what were the areas of concern so we can do something about it. And so one of the first things we did uh, was try and look at whether there's any association between asthma. We looked at hospitalizations, estimated prevalence, and we looked at COVID-19 case rates um, over a temporal scale. So three months, six months, nine months, 12 months into the pandemic. And I'm just showing you three and 12 here. And we sort of looked at that in relation to a bunch of environmental factors. So this is uh, respiratory hazard index. It's a sort of a risk index from EPA. We looked at ozone levels, PM 2.5 levels. Uh, social vulner vulnerability index is something from CDC. Again, it's sort of like a risk factor that looks at what is your risk of being unhealthy or just being unable to cope with things as they happen. So disasters, for example, hurricanes and so on, um, you know, due to socioeconomic status, household composition. So this is looking at things like single parent households, uh, minority status and language barrier, housing and transportation. So this looks at that unhealthy housing. Um, and also like if you don't have vehicles, for example, and then overall SBI. And then finally, we have the asthma measures here. And what we saw was that early in the pandemic, it seemed like there was a, a you know, moderately strong association between ozone levels and COVID-19 incidents. Um, and we saw PM 2.5 levels sort of connected there, but later in the pandemic, which we were kind of, kind of it, it was interesting to see how over time these associations change. Um, looking at social vulnerability status, um, not surprising socioeconomic status, it was associated with risk of asthma being poorly controlled, but COVID-19, you know, we really saw the uh, minority status and language barrier risk due to those factors um, being about moderately correlated. Um, but one of the things that struck out to us was that one of the strongest correlation coefficients was between the estimated prevalence of asthma and COVID-19 incidence rate at three months. Uh, we didn't think this was like a direct cause effect necessarily. Uh, we think that it's very likely the same things that are um, increasing your likelihood of getting asthma or also sort of increasing your likelihood of getting COVID. And so when we kind of really broke down a lot of factors, a couple of things that jumped out were percent population minority and percent households without a vehicle. Uh, that second was, was very interesting to me, right? Because if you think about it in Louisiana, if you don't have a vehicle, things are tough. Like even just your ability to go grocery shopping or go to the doctor, right? I didn't have a car for my entire undergrad here. Um, it, was, it was not pretty <laughs> or fun. Um, and also if you think about it, uh, how much more, or especially early in the pandemic, right, before people wore masks and stuff, if you use the buses, you're exposed to all these other people in a confined space as well. So that's something to consider. Um, so, you know, that sort of answered our first question. We sort of found this web of relationships between social vulnerability factors, asthma, environmental factors, and COVID-19. And at some point, we need to disentangle this web. Um, but one of, you know, what we really wanted to do was identify those areas of concern first. So uh, what we first did was we defined environmental justice areas as census tracts with high social and environmental vulnerability. So what that meant was the social vulnerability index from CDC had to be in the 75th percentile or higher for the entire state for those census tracts. And then one of these environmental factors, either this uh, respiratory hazard index from EPA, the PM 2.5 levels or the ozone levels had to be again in the 75th percentile for the state or higher. And when we use these metrics, we identified 137 census tracts. Um, and one of the things that jumped out to me was that, you know, 
when we talk environmental justice, we often only talk outdoor air, ambient air pollution, but about 60% of these areas actually called and reported also indoor environmental concerns. And primarily this was mold in homes. And what this is telling us is that you know, environmental justice, it, it's not just the air you breathe outside your home. It's also the homes that you live in, right? Like, and that's not something that we always consider. Um, when we overlaid which environmental justice areas had a high estimated prevalence of asthma and high COVID-19 incidents, there were about 15 census tracts, uh, and about a third of them were in the Northwest in Caddo Parish. And if we simply looked at which areas, which EJ areas had high estimated asthma prevalence, there were about 75. Not surprisingly, most of them were um, around East Baton Rouge and Orleans uh, Parish areas. Uh, mostly these tracks were in urban areas, some in rural, um, but regardless, we, I, we realized that these would be great places uh, to target some asthma and COVID-19 mitigation measures and possibly study further what this connection might be between asthma and COVID-19. Um, so we launched what we call the BREATHE, the Bringing Respiratory Health Equity for Asthmatics Through Healthier Environments program. Uh, we have a partnership with Our Lady of the Lake Children's Hospital to provide virtual home visits. Uh, we've been targeting these visits in the EJ areas of concern. We've been getting referrals from COVID contact tracers so we can really serve the populations more affected by COVID-19. Uh, we've trained LDH community health workers in how to do asthma education. Um, and then one of the things we'd like to do more with this is explore if uh, COVID-19 actually did increase the burden of asthma over time. Uh, but the other thing, you know, that it occurs to me in terms of addressing the problem is we desperately need more research. Um, I've been a wet bench scientist for long enough to tell you that unless you can show the mechanism, every reviewer is going to come back and ask you, so how does it work? Right. And so one of the things that came to my mind is that connection we saw with ozone. So areas with high ozone consistently showed high rates of COVID-19 incidents, as well as asthma pre prevalence, only pollutant and hospitalization, really. Um, and then it's only pollutant that showed an independent effect, and it also showed um, an, an additive effect over social vulnerability. So if, you're, if you live in an area with high ozone, you're more affected. And then if it, it had high social vulnerability index, it was even more affected. Um, and so then the question in my mind is always, was it direct or was it indirect? How does it work? Um, indirect is not unbelievable. Ozone is often like an urban pollutant, urban areas, more people, more spread. Um, but it's not completely, you know, implausible for it to be a direct effect. In 2012, there was a paper that showed that exposure to ozone could result in oxidative stress in your lungs, um, which then kind of messed up protease, anti-protease balance. And it's been observed in some other conditions as well, which can then affect how easily viruses, and in this case, influenza can enter your cells. Um, is there something similar for COVID-19? Food for thought, right? Um, and so that, that sort of brings me to the conclusion of my first story. Uh, the second story is the one that is, uh, I would really like to sort of uh, highlight Liana here because uh, primarily, so she is a PhD candidate at the Superfund Research Center and uh, one whom Dr. Kumi and I co-mentor. And she's, she's done most of the work for this and, and she's done a great job with us. Um, and and this, this story is really related to a place that you may or may not have heard in the news. It's called Colfax. Um, Colfax is a small place in central Louisiana in Grant Parish. And uh, it's sort of uh, popular for being close to an open, open burn site. Um, but, you know, we, Z Colfax is zip code 71417. And so I really pulled this data because um, all our health data is based on zip codes. And so Colfax is located in Grand Parish, about 5,000 population in the zip code with some nearby unincorporated communities. Median age, demographics, median income, poverty rate, all of it really comparable to Louisiana as a whole. Keep that in mind as we, as we look, at the, look at some of the slides in the future. As I mentioned, it is mostly famous um, for its proximity to an open burn site. As you can see, it's quite close. Um, and the community there has often complained about noise. So what, what they do there is, is they burn um, 
ammunitions that are not used anymore. So there are explosions, there is noise, there's air pollution, smoke plumes, and the community there feels that there are health effects from this exposure. Uh, again, not implausible because open burning like that has been known to um, release free radical containing part or particle pollution containing free radicals. Um, and these would be called EPFRs, environmentally persistent free radicals. And those have been connected to cardiovascular, respiratory, immunological and neurological health effects. Um, so what we did was we looked at various diseases connected with air pollution that we would expect in that area. Um, and we looked at respiratory conditions, cardiovascular conditions, and cancers. I will not show you the data today for cancer, but really there was not a whole lot of uh, difference there anyway. And we looked at estimated prevalence, mortality, so death rates, um, and cancer incidence. And then all of this we adjusted for age, because we all know as we get older, we get sicker, right? And so we, we do want to adjust this for age. Um, what I'm showing you in these next few slides, uh, the rate ratios. So as a ratio, it's essentially looking at Colfax compared to nearby zip codes, Grand Parish as a whole, and Louisiana as a whole. And so as a ratio, if it's one, right, that means Colfax is the same as whatever geography we're comparing it to. If it's greater than one, uh, then Colfax, the rate is higher than the comparing geography. Um, and so what you see is that, for instance, for all respiratory diseases, uh, hospitalizations in Colfax are higher by about 1.5 times, right, when you compare it to uh, hospitalization for respiratory diseases in all of Louisiana. Um, and the one that we really saw the most consistent effects for was asthma. Estimated prevalence in Colfax was about 40% higher than in all of Louisiana, and about 20% higher when we compared it to uh, Grand Parish and like other nearby areas in Grand Parish around Colfax. Um, cardiovascular diseases, kind of a similar story. Um, estimated prevalence was uh, about 20 to 30% higher in Colfax um, when we compared it to Grand Parish or Louisiana as a whole. What's really sad in my mind is that people are not just sicker, they're also dying more often. Um, so deaths due to all cardiovascular diseases, and then it's broken up here by hypertensive disorders, so hypertension, high blood pressure, and then heart attacks, uh, death rates due to, from cardiovascular diseases sort of ranged from uh, being 1.5 to 3 times the rate in Grand Parish or Louisiana as a whole. Um, and this is controlling for age, right? So remember how all those demographics look kind of similar um, to Louisiana, but then people are sicker and they're dying more. Um, in this area. So then, of course, the big question is, uh, is it to do with proximity to the open burn site because we're environmental health scientists? So to estimate that, what we did was we drew three buffer zones, 5, 10, and 15 kilometers from this red X here, which is the open burn site. And for reference, there's Colfax. And as I mentioned, all our health data is based on zip code and uh, Colfax and a lot of other nearby sort of unincorporated communities came under the same zip code. Um, and then they were all within these sort of buffer zones. So we also kind of divided this up and looked at it by quadrant. So what are things looking like, you know, within this buffer, this five kilometer buffer, but what's it looking like in the Northeast versus Northwest versus Southwest versus Southeast? And this was also relevant because if you think about it, the, the wind doesn't always blow equally in every direction, right? So a windrose that was uh, drawn by the Superfund Research Program showed that during our study years, 2000 to 2017, the wind blew from south to north right more often than um, in other directions so these three arrows are bigger essentially means uh, that the wind blew more often from here to here um, what our data showed was not entirely unexpected uh, we saw cardiovascular diseases and so essentially what we're looking at here is uh, the percentage of cases uh, in each buffer zone by quadrant, right? And we're comparing that to the population in those buffer zones in those quadrants. And what we saw was that in the Northwest hospitalization cases, see how this light blue bar is taller than the dark blue bar? What, is it, what it's essentially indicating is that hospitalization cases for cardiovascular diseases 
in the Northwest, zero to five kilometer, five to 10, 10 to 15, and all of these buffer zones are overrepresented compared to the population that's in this area. Right. So how do we think about this? So, for instance, if I'm comparing two rooms, right, we have five people in each room and in one room, let's say we have a lot of older people or even let's say it's the same population number. You know, if one room has four out of five people who are sick and the other has one out of five people who are sick. So the four out of five, you know, it's it's that overrepresentation that we're seeing relative to the population. Um, the Northeast, we saw that effect in zero to five kilometer. Uh, southwest, we saw a little bit of that pretty much everywhere. Southeast, not a whole lot of overrepresentation at all. Uh, respiratory diseases, something similar. So in the Northwest, again, we saw an overrepresentation of hospitalization compared to population um, in all three of the buffer zones. Northeast, we didn't really see an overrepresentation. Southwest, a little bit. Again, in all three buffer zones. Again, Southeast, not much. So if you remember, Colfax was in the Southeast, right? And so that's what we've been sort of thinking about, you know, city of Colfax, even though we're sort of thinking of the entire zip code with all these other unincorporated communities. So then the question is, what's in the Northwest? If it's not the city of Colfax, what's out there? So uh, this, is, this is a map with this middle right here. Again, this is the open burn site. Down there is Colfax. And up in the Northwest, you have this tiny community called Summerfield, same zip code as Colfax, right? So it's included in all of the health data we're looking at, uh, right there in the zero to five kilometer buffer zone. In the five to 10 kilometer buffer zone, we have Aloha, Waddle, um, and then in the 10 to 15, we have Odra. Aloha also has the same zip code as Colfax, Waddle and Odra have uh, different zip codes. Um, all of these places, if you notice, there's no hospitals here, right? All of the hospitals are down in Colfax or up here close to Montgomery. So if you think about our hospitalization data, we're probably actually underestimating the burden of disease in the Northwest because chances are people are not even going to the hospital as often as they would for us to be able to collect that data, right? If, they, if their access to the hospital because they tend to be farther away is so limited, um, the problems they have is probably more than what we are able to track from our hospitalization data. Um, so just to kind of summarize this, we were able to confirm that Colfax and nearby communities do display a higher burden of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, and that the effect is more pronounced in the northwest of the open burn site. And these results are consistent with exposure to particulate matter containing EPFRs. Um, but one of the things we need to also think about is that we need to clarify the effects of the social determinants of health. Access to healthcare, for example, is one of those things that I just mentioned, right? Uh, race, income, all those things. So even though that zip code, the demographics is very similar to Louisiana, the city of Colfax itself is very, very poor. Uh, they also tend to be younger. They tend to be poorer, more un unemployment higher poverty rate, all these things have an effect. So it's something to consider. Um, and so then, of course, the big question, how do we address it? Um, of course, as I mentioned, we need to understand the relative contribution of environmental exposures versus social determinants of health. And this is something that Liana is working on right now. Uh, we need to develop messaging to share this data with area residents. Uh, conduct outreach to improve access and use of preventive care. We may not be able to stop people from being sicker, but let's hope we can stop people from dying from these things, right? Um, and then, of course, um, alternatives to open air burning. There's got to be a way to get rid of ammunition, right? Do the things we need to do for industry um, to do their thing um, and also not expose people to particulate matter pollution that makes them sicker. And uh, so, you know... Uh, I see Dr. Donzi and Dr. Gleason sitting here scratching their heads and I'm like, well, Runa, thanks for the talk, but you know, I, I work in the wet lab. How does, how does this apply to me? Um, and really it does because we need to bridge that gap between basic and applied scientists. I mentioned earlier how a lot of these effects uh, they're connected to epigenetics. They have neurological effects. And I mentioned these two things in particular because I know that's what Dr. Donzi and Dr. Gleason work on. Um, and, and 
these things need to come together with applied science so we can understand the mechanisms behind things. Once you go in with the mechanism, the stronger your case is, the more likely you are to be able to convince somebody to do things differently. Um, and, and so without that, right, uh, as dry scientists, you know, dry lab scientists, it's going to be harder for us to be able to um, do things, which is why the collaboration with the Superfund Research Center is, is so meaningful and we're so grateful to it. Okay, great. So that, that's the end of my talk. A lot of people to thank, uh, particularly people in my section, uh, Shannon, Kathleen, and Kate, the Superfund Research Program, uh, Dr. Cormier, Liana, all my mentors at LSU. It's good to be back. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here in person or on Zoom. Uh, and let me not forget my uh, federal funding partners, uh, CDC, EPA, and of course, NIH um, for funding the Superfund Research Program. Thank you, everyone. In the room. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, so you gave some examples of potential multi-generational epigenetic effects early on. Is there any evidence of things like something as complicated as viral virus susceptibility uh, might have some sort of multi-generational <laughs> epigenetic? Uh, <laughs> you know, I've worked on transposons. <laughs> I said, you know, I've worked on vector transposons. He was in, in my committee for uh, those who may not be aware. Great question. Um, there, there, there is some stuff out there, um, particularly those that can cross the placenta, um, but it's not really known how much of that is because of the virus itself versus epigenetic effects from it. And then there's also maternal immunological things that are happening that can cross the placental barrier and can have an effect. So that connection is very muddy, if that helps. That's why I said something is complicated. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel confident saying yes, there definitely is. Yes, there is a possibility. That's a great question. So it is, um, yes. I, I've got a couple of questions. First of all, um, oxidative stress, right? So ozone induces oxidative stress. Oxidative stress leads to increased incidence of COVID. Particulate matter induces oxidative stress, leads to an increase in COVID or and other respiratory viral infections. Do you think that oxidative stress that's being induced by these exposures are actually altering the genomes of the viruses? So for example, y'all are sequencing these COVID-19 samples. Yes. Are you seeing increased in incidences of genetic yeah. mutations in the viruses across the State. Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. So this whole genome sequencing of the virus is complicated. Yeah, we no, don't we know do. where these where these samples come from. It's just simply surveillance, right? So it's a random set of samples that get sent okay. out without. Okay. Right. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> right, but wouldn't that? That would be cool. And that's a that's a great question. I think the tough part would be because viruses recombine so much anyhow. I guess. Right. But and we yeah. We've done a, a small like pilot in the lab looking at oxidative stress and genomes of viruses. But when you send it off for sequencing, the first thing they do is send you back variants. And I'm like, I don't want variants. I want yeah. genetic changes. And yep. so I'm looking at genetic stability. So we have to send it back. Yeah. But yeah. then send us back the real data from the sequencing reactions. Mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering if you had access to that. No, I, I don't. Unfortunately, no one does just because of the way the, the whole sequencing situation is set up to COVID at the moment. So. So, the socioeconomic status that you did for the COVID study, how was that determined? Did you use insurance rates? Ah, uh, great question. It it all came from the American Community Survey data. Yes. All right, and then I found there with the asthma and COVID data is steroid use, right? Because if a person was actually on inhaled corticosteroids, you could see how that would suppress their immune system and actually lead to either an infection that was moderately or more mm -hmm. severe mm -hmm. uh, than previously, and therefore you would end up in the hospital with COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, great question. So actually, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the papers that came out were sh showed that it did not have enough of an effect to make you sicker. And so the whole paper was about how inhaled corticosteroid use should not stop 
because of the fear of COVID-19. So your, the risk from you not using that was way higher compared to the risk of you getting sicker because of the virus, yes. I don't want to dominate the question, so. <laughs> Uh, in Louisiana, we have very rural areas and very urban areas. So I'm wondering, can you do comparisons to look at, for example, numbers versus ozone outcomes? For example, I think it would be hard to say the full tax, there's little of them. Or uh, and then it's complicated. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to Tested, people, yeah. Which, which of these positive cases are the most important? We need cohort studies, yeah, Dr. Right. Kermit. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're working on a cohort study, and actually, it's it's more difficult than you would think to, to do the efforts. So right now, we're using like historical hazardous mm -hmm. data. Nobody's capturing this data. Yeah. The yeah. community doesn't have monitors there. The state doesn't have monitors. DQ only samples stuff when the community reports that there's a problem. So the data is erratic. Um, and so what we're doing is we're deploying samplers to this region, and then we're going to uh, collect human patient samples, and then measure what those samples have in them, what exposures those people had, and then coordinate that with the environmental health effects that we're seeing in that population. But that's a, it's a long term. It's, it's probably yeah. taken us almost three years to get here. Yeah. I don't want to say anything. <laughs> Tell us but right, the state of Louisiana gets a lot of money to take this. It's a, it's a, yeah, but it's public, right? And it's the largest open air burning hazardous waste burning facility in the United States. This is oh. One of the only. It is ones. one of the. No, no, it's not the only. Mm. It is the largest. This is a very, very complicated site. They have a very, very complicated history with DEQ. So most DEQ monitors, they're actually set up based on population. So most of those actually end up being um, in the corridor between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And very few of them, like what, there's like one in North, Northeast or Northwest, North Louisiana like one in the middle and then one in the Southwest. So, um, and, and it's it's sort of based on population um, and there's several totally different types. Yeah, and yeah the ty there's different types of monitors too. Not everything, right. not data, data from all the different types of monitors are not considered EPA grade. So it, it, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> and not all monitors, even if they collect PM, they may not speciate what's in yeah, the Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Complicated. And then even the size of the community, like uh, Luna's mentioning, 5,000 people, statistically, if you, if you identify a small number that has an effect, you could actually de-identify that population. So yes. we've run, that's why we're doing zip code level stuff, honestly. And so that hinders the information you get from the study, but protects the patient population. So something like complicated in a rural area. Yeah, something something like Summerfield, right? They don't even make the census. I mean, their census is together with Colfax and Mont. I think Odra is with Montgomery, Aloha, and Summerfield are with Col. Yeah, it's like Baton Rouge and maybe how Zachary used to be. Now it's a lot bigger. There was a, a question on this uh, so it's from Ed Oh, Trapito. Hi, Ed. <laughs> it says, you may know that St. John Parish, where there is a major chloroquine pollution issue, at one point had the highest rate of COVID in the country. They also report a lot of asthma. The impression I have is that asthma causes the inflammation of the lungs, and that COVID comes along and results in a lot more inflammation of the lungs, all of which combined to produce the high, produce the high death rates early in the pandemic. Yeah, great question. So one of the things that a lot of studies looked at related to asthma 
um, inflammation, hospitalization, COVID-19. So I think personally that the inflammation um, due to asthma in your lungs may make you slightly more likely to get sick, just like you know, it might make you slightly more likely to get sick from influenza and then suffer for it and, and things like that. Uh, but the deaths have actually not been that high with asthma compared to things like obesity and cardiovascular diseases. St. John Parish is, is actually a very interesting area and it is an area that we would love to study more. But again, it's one of those areas that we're really, really hindered by the population size. Uh, which makes it hard um, to do much, especially with COVID. Because I mean, if, if you noticed here, this is like 18 years worth of data, right? And like COVID, we have about a couple of years worth. Um, so that that does make it difficult, but, but great question. And thank you for bringing up St. John. It, it's definitely an area that needs to be looked at more. There are no further questions. I would like us to once again thank Bruna for coming from the other side of Baton Rouge to give us a talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. I'm sorry, too, couldn't be here. I know people appreciate it. You might look at. I'm hoping he sees the.